Okay, while we're just waiting for some more um, participants to join us today, then uh, I'll just uh, briefly introduce myself. My name is Rebecca. I'm one of the international marketing and recruitment team here at the university, and I'll be acting as the moderator today. Um, we this is this is an event, uh, a webinar with the program staff uh, from our um, engineering and technology. Uh, departments and we uh, are hosting many of these kinds of events in the next few days uh, over the next two weeks or so um, where we're hoping that you get a chance to get to know some things about different uh, subject areas, meet with our program staff and students and also uh, speak to us as recruitment staff with any questions that you might have about your application. So this is one of the many events that we're ho holding over the next couple of weeks. And I will ask um, my colleague uh, to share a link in the chat so that you can have a look at what other kinds of events uh, are upcoming. Um, if you do hear or see my colleague Audrey, she's gonna be answering uh, questions today um, that maybe are more general. And we're gonna take uh, as many questions we can relating to the subject area of engineering and technology and specifically the um, programs that you see represented here today by these program staff who have kindly joined us, thank you. Um, so we will basically be holding a Q&A and you can use the Q&A function here on Zoom to ask your question. And then uh, if you see a question that you also share, please feel free to upvote it so that we know that it's a common query that we should um, make sure to prioritize. And uh, yeah, I guess we, we have sort of slowed down with the entries, so we'll just go ahead already. Um, and for anybody who didn't hear, my name's Rebecca and I'll be moderating this session today. Um, so I will uh, start by letting our guest panelists introduce themselves. So can I please ask uh, you one by one to introduce yourself, what you work with and the programs or department that you represent. And uh, we can start with um, Michael and then go to Hassan, then Liang, then Dan. Hello, my name is uh, Michael Lentmeyer. I'm the director of the wireless communications program. I'm working at the Department of Electrical and Information Technology. And uh, I'm doing research in the area of wireless communications, but I'm also teaching some of the courses in the program. And uh, I'm also active in IEEE, in the board in Sweden. So these are the things I'm doing. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hassan Fatehi. I'm a director of Master Program Sustainable Energy Engineering. It's uh, uh, part of I'm part of the Department of Energy Sciences, and um, uh, my own research are on, in computational fluid dynamics and uh, combustion and also biomass conversion. I also teach two courses in this master's program, uh, one related to computational flow dynamic and one is biomass conversion or is in general is on bioenergy. And the program, as the name suggests, is uh, mainly regarding the different uh, renewable energy uh, pro power production or electricity or power or uh, production of renewable energies. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Leonel. I'm the program director of uh, Embedded Electronics Engineering. And then I'm an associate professor in the Department of Electric and Information Technology. So same to Michelle and that I'm doing both research and teaching. And my main research area is integrated circuit design for 6G wireless and machine learning. Thanks. And then finally, Dan. Oh, sorry, Dan, you're still muted. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, my name is Don Hesman. I'm a, a director of the master program in nanoscience. Uh, I am uh, from uh, the physics department, and um, specifically, I'm working with semiconductors, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, light interaction with uh, semiconductors, in particular, semiconductors on the nanoscale. So it's a strong coupling to this program. I'm also teaching two of the, uh, one, one mandatory course and one optional uh, course in, in, the, in the master program. 
Great, thank you. And I, I forgot to mention that unfortunately we couldn't be joined by our colleague from biotechnology today, but if anybody does have questions around that program, we can always take those um, separately or like at a later date via email. So please do get in touch with um, the biotechnology uh, team if uh, you have a question about that. Okay, so uh, I'll encourage everybody again to please ask your questions in the Q&A because we would love to hear um, what courses you're interested in, what programs, what areas of study, and um, direct some questions to our staff here today. But in the meantime, I will ask some um, questions to our panelists that are very uh, common questions that we get. Um, and we'll we'll just basically uh, go through some of those. Uh, and then uh, once uh, we get some more questions in the Q&A, we'll start looking at those. So um, I would really like to ask everybody actually uh, today, why do you think that a student who is interested in your subject area should apply to your program? So what is kind of unique about your program or what can they gain that maybe they couldn't gain if they studied the program elsewhere? Um, and let's go around in the same order again, if that's OK. So we'll start with um, Michael. Oh, sorry, Michael, you're also muted. <laughs> sorry. Yes. No, Thank I'm uh, OK. Thanks. Uh, well, I think uh, what is really special here in Lund is uh, that we have, since a very long time, wireless research happening and industry. Ericsson in Lund used to be the headquarter for mobile uh, phones. Uh, nowadays, Ericsson is not active in phones directly anymore. They are more uh, developing networks, but we have a big history. Uh, even the Bluetooth standard, if you know that, has been de developed by people here in Lund. So this is a, a big success, I would say. Uh, so, and, and we have lots of people in the city at the university and outside that are involved in, in wireless communications. Great, thank you. And then if we can move on to sustainable energy engineering. Uh, okay, uh, I think, um, you know, the main uh, motivation that we started this master program uh, two years ago was that the transition to to renewable energies and that's i i don't think we need to to really motivate that one uh, so we basically built this master's program with this transition in mind that uh, we need to be uh, very uh, cautious about the amount of carbon that we are releasing and then uh, while producing uh, energy and the focus is on uh, renewable energies and also we built this master program on a really strong research activities that we are doing in the departments and there are four departments uh, involved and uh, it's, it's a kind of very comprehensive view of this uh, uh, renewable technologies that we cover in this uh, in this program also there is a I would say rather a strong connection with uh, with various industries that uh, are active in this field that uh, are either participating as guest lectures or study visits and and uh, uh, or part of master's uh, thesis that the student can do at the end of the the program. Okay. Great, thank you. And then embedded electronics. Yeah, thank you. I think the, the very first thing is that the Nund and the Nund University is a very nice place. Look at the background picture of Rebecca and the Michelle. That's what you can have during the summer and the autumn of Nund. And then more dedicated to our program, I think that now the global shortage of integrated circuits and the semiconductor chips, and especially the shortage of engineers who can do this. I think it's a very attractive. And then our program, we have actually world leading and top researchers in the top program in the program. And then we have a very nice industry in Nunt. Michelle mentioned Ericsson. We also have ARM. We have Volvo cars and we have access communication. So we have a nice interaction with industry. Yeah. Great, thank you. And that? Okay, I, I, many reasons, I guess. But one, as, as Liang was saying, is that I think Lund University is a many students appreciate this as a great place to, to come and study. And uh, in many aspects, and one is that uh, 
I actually just on the way here spoke to a few students and they said that, I mean, they love that we as teachers are quite approachable compared to what they were used to. So, so this close uh, interaction and close uh, uh, friendship uh, sort of uh, between teacher and, and student uh, is very, uh, is great, I think. And I think many students appreciate that. And it's quite different from other places. And also that, uh, at least in my uh, subject, uh, we have lots of laboratory exercises and, and where you actually get hands-on and the theory and the experiments are sort of uh, uh, mixed uh, together in, in, a, in, in a good way. Uh, when it comes to nanoscience specifically, uh, we at Lund University have a great um, tradition now since many years of doing nanoscience. Nanoscience to me is very much an interdisciplinary uh, activity, research and education. And um, we have what is called Nanolund, uh, which is an umbrella organization for all researchers at Lund University who are interested in nanoscience. So there's bio biologists and uh, med medical people and uh, chemists and physicists and electrical, en electrical engineers uh, working together uh, in various uh, configurations. And this program, this master program is very much related to this. So you have opportunities to go in many different uh, ways with a strong connection to uh, world leading uh, research. Brilliant. Um, oh, and one yeah. thing more, sorry. Uh, and that is uh, we, we now are building, one is already up and running, MAX4, and the other one is ESS, the European Spallation Source. So that these world unique facilities for material science uh, studies uh, that are uh, being built and uh, here in Lund and uh, where the nanoscience is very much connected to that. So there are great opportunities and unique things happening. Brilliant, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, those. it's great um, to highlight those resources that we've got as well. Um, wonderful, so we actually have got a couple of questions coming in now in the Q&A. And one of the um, participants today has asked about computer science. And we don't have in the field of um, technology and engineering something that is specifically called Masters in Computer Science. However, of course, you're working with technology. Many of you and many of your programs will incorporate elements of that. So I wondered whether perhaps um, any of you would like to speak about the, the relevance of uh, or the, the more specific area that you're um, working in within that kind of area. So I know, uh, I believe that embedded electronics engineering and wireless communications, you both have some elements of this, um, but you're more niche. So perhaps you would like to speak on this. Yeah, uh, um, probably I can start. So for the embedded electronics engineering, actually we have relevant uh, elements for computer science. So we have courses in computer architecture from the hardware side, and we also have uh, elective courses like uh, efficient C programming and other programming languages uh, from the software side. And then what is the trend today is that you cannot really decoupling hardware and software. So that's one of the unique thing for our program that we do co-optimization between software and hardware to make things more efficient. Great, thank you. Uh, and Michael? Yes, I, I would say uh, that uh, Computer science and electrical engineering are the two disciplines that are closely related to what we are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a bachelor's in one of those fields, you are very well suited to study here. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that we do really have uh, computer science courses as part of the program directly, but you could take some elective course in that field specifically if you want to. But, but we certainly need the background of computer science uh, bachelor education for, for doing the things we do. I think uh, mathematics and programming are one of the most important tools that we need, uh, aside from the more hardware related issues that, that uh, Liang uh, is expert in. Great, thank you. So that's encouraging for anybody who is attending today with that kind of background, that there is an area for them to get involved with here if they would like to. Um, we also uh, do have, of course, in the science uh, area uh, of the university, we do have, for example, a program in computational science, scientific computing and other like uh, specialisms relating more to other sciences, such as physics, geology, chemistry, et cetera. But that is something that um, if that's the area of interest, then of course, um, anybody attending is very welcome to join our later webinar um, for the science faculty. And you'll be welcome to ask questions there about those programs. Um, okay, and 
So now I will move on to um, another uh, area that is often very interesting um, for our for our students, um, and that's relating to the actual um, practicalities of applying. So basically, lots of our um, applicants ask, uh, how can they ensure to make a successful application? Like, what is most important to you when you're looking at applications? So perhaps you can each speak a little on something relating to that selection criteria um, and what you're looking at when you're seeking your um, your prospective students. So uh, we can follow the same, we can go Michael and then Hassam and then Liang and then Dan. Thank you. I think one of the recommendations I have is that you fill in this special form where you are kind of summarizing the things that we ask for. Those students that don't fill in that, it cost us much more time to, uh, to work on and uh, this is typically also related to some little bit negative bias in the evaluation I would say uh, but uh, aside from that I think it's important that you have the formal requirements uh, but then also of course you can add anything that motivates why you want to study the field why you think that you have the right background and it fits to you so try to uh, spend some efforts in not just trying to make a quick application, but really advertising your profile to us also, so that you can get a good ranking and not just be qualified for it. Right, yeah, and it is something that we know that a lot of students um, don't see always when they're looking for these um, the program specific documents. So when you're on the program pages for any participants watching who don't know that, you should make sure to look and see whether there's um, anything in the section titled program specific documents. And usually it will be a summary sheet for these uh, programs, which, which as um, you just mentioned, is an opportunity for the prospective student to actually explain <laughs> their previous uh, education and and help you like help the staff to understand like where that is uh, coming from I think because of course people are applying from all over the world so yeah I think that's a great tip thank you very much and I will actually share um here in the chat I will share the um subject area uh web page where you can look at all of these program pages so for anybody watching who wants to check what is required for these programs, you can go there and have a look on, on those pages also. Okay, Hassan, what would you like to say about this? Oh, uh, actually I want to uh, endorse what Michael said is uh, uh, basically is very uh, true. Uh, and um, also we didn't very much limit from what bachelor degree name students can, can apply because, you know, it's very different from all over uh, around the world and uh, but we are looking for uh, some specific knowledge as a as a prerequisite to the to the program and that's very important for example to make sure that they show that they they have uh, thermodynamics is is very important for us if uh, to see that so if they can highlight maybe they had this course under slightly different name so if they can highlight it that okay I believe this is the thermodynamics of the one that you're looking for more specifically. So that would be very helpful for the application. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I fully agree with Misha and uh, Hassan. I think uh, be more specific on your background dedicated to this program, especially the, the form that the mission mentioned. And then I think that's the entry point when we evaluate um, one of the entry documents. And also an, another suggestion is try to be uh, organized when you submit the documents. So sometimes query is uh, not the, the worst thing compared to submit them a lot of document. So be organized and then try to guide the uh, reviewers to, to your background. Great tips, thank you. Yeah, I... I... I agree with what, or I have sort of similar setup as, as uh, Hesam described, namely that, uh, as I said before, my science is very broad, so I'm, I'm happy to accept students with various background. There should be some engineering or science uh, background, uh, but then we still, in order to fit with the, with the uh, courses that we offer, and in particular, them, uh, we start with one semester of uh, mandatory courses and uh, to, be, to be able to 
follow them, we need some basic requirements. And uh, we have decided to have a starting point in physics um, in this program. So we require some physics, so a little bit of quantum mechanics, a little bit about what solids or, or semiconductors or something like that. Not very much, but something. And uh, what is quite often is that you have in your bachelor studied physics one, physics two, physics three, and it's really impossible for me to judge what of physics is part of, of this. So again, this um, uh, sheet that we want you to fill in is really valuable because then you can say, yes, we, I got an introduction to quantum mechanics in physics three. Uh, that uh, is, is extremely uh, helpful. Great. Thank you. Some good practical tips there from all of you. Thank you very much. I actually, yeah. sorry for, uh, I also remember, it's, uh, occasionally students uh, submit, you're required to, to upload some document in, in original format mm -hmm. or some, some certified format or so. Occasionally, this is not done and it's not discovered until uh, it's too late. And then, and then people, students are not accepted despite they've in practice fulfill everything, but the right documents are not there. So, so I guess this is what Liang said also, that be a bit careful, check that everything is in the right format. I don't know what this is like. So Rebecca and, and others here could maybe help answering those questions better than I, but, but uh, it's unfortunate, I think, when a great student uh, cannot qualify because of some paperwork that uh, was fake. Yeah, exactly. We also do uh, see that sometimes and we, we agree, we try to stress this, that um, you can look on, for anyone watching who isn't sure, you know, what your particular, um, wherever you studied, your country of study, um, you need to make sure that you check the requirements for your documents from that country, because it can be different depending where you previously studied. Um, so I can send uh, the link here to the, it's the general um, admission site for the whole of Sweden. Um, but within that site, then there are these guidelines about your documents depending on your country of study. So that's definitely, and you can also attend one of our other sessions about applicate, general application tips, um, which will run through these kinds of things. Ah, thank you, Audrey, for sharing that. That's very helpful. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to check. Yeah, so we have a, a question in the Q&A around course ranking, but I think that is more of a general question around, again, this, this process of applying on university admissions rather than um, rather than uh, specific to the programs. But what I can say, and I think all of the attendees today would agree, is that programs are competitive. And it is, of course, very beneficial if you rank us highly um, in your choices of programs, because uh, if you don't, then of course, other students will get considered before you're um, considered. So that's just a general note, unless anyone wants to add something to that. Um, but I think it's just a general thing that these programs are competitive and you have to, you have to really, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the, the um, course, uh, well, I suppose it's the program um, experience, like the study experience. Um, so I want to ask everybody, uh, how many students are there generally in your programs and how many are international students? So we'll go around again as usual, starting with Michael. Well, uh, in our program, I would say we have 100% international students. Uh, because oh, wow. we, have, we have the possibility for the Swedish programs to take similar courses as a specialization. So, so they don't actually have to go to our wireless program uh, formally to take the courses. Uh, so we have international students from all over the world and uh, we have 30 seats uh, and in in the past years due, due to the pandemic uh, the numbers have gone down of those people that that have applied so so we had less than that it, it went down to uh, even below 20 uh, so so you can expect something between say 15 and 30 as, as the size of the group. So it is actually so that you have a very, this is what uh, was mentioned by Dan earlier also, it, it's it's kind of a very nice environment. You are very close to the teacher. We know all the students, basically. You can come and talk to us. You, you know all your colleagues also. So, so I think this is a very nice 
nice thing, especially for, for the master programs uh, where, where things are more specialized, uh, the groups are in a size that makes it uh, very, very efficient also. That's great. Sounds good. Okay, Hassan. Uh, uh, our program is um, is rather young. We have only two groups of students who are, uh, you know, the first group started two years ago, and we limit ourselves because, you know, it was the first group to only 16. Uh, the second year, uh, the admission went up to, to 30 students. And uh, yeah, we are we are also very close to 100 percent international uh, and we are from everywhere in the world. So we have a very diverse group. Uh, yeah, but we are thinking of planning to to increase the numbers. So maybe in three, four, five years, we can we're going to to reach to 50 students every year. So, but I don't think this is the, the, the aim for, for the upcoming year because maybe not two biggest steps increasing the number of students. So I was saying maybe 40 students for the next year we are planning for. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, for us, I think it's a similar case uh, to Wallis communication. So we have an uh, international program uh, with uh, number of students between 20, 20 to 30. And then we actually in the courses, we have both the international master students and also the Swedish students in the specialization of uh, integrated circuit design. And then I can say the case in this year is about half half. So half international students, half Swedish students. And then in the course, I think you will study together with the Swedish students and then do project together. I think that will speed up your uh, integration into the environment and also you feel more comfortable here to interact with different students and teachers. Great, thank you. Nano science, not only because of the name Nano, but uh, maybe for other reasons, this is a fairly small program. Uh, so uh, we have 10 students. Uh, there could be more, but uh, right now it's 10. Uh, but the, all classes are taken together with other uh, programs. So in particular, uh, the, the origin of this program, one can say, is that we started a five-year engineering program uh, within the sort of Swedish system where Swedish is actually required to, to, to be accepted. But then those students, it's, it's in practice like a three-year bachelor and then two-year master uh, studies. And these two-year master studies are, are uh, lots of elective courses. And then we thought, why not have students come from elsewhere to join in these last two master years? Because those courses are anyway only given in English. So this is the way this is done. So you, if you come to this, if you're a master student in this program, you will be in classes with other students, both Swedish students, but also exchange students and, and the, uh, students from elsewhere. So it's a, it's a mix. Uh, so, uh, but this group master students are like 10 or so. Uh, actually, as I said, I, on the way here, I, I spoke to some of the students and they thought this was a good combination that you, it's a very small group. So you really get to know the other students in the program, and but you also uh, meet other students uh, so you can sort of uh, network with um, other students. Um, and and the, uh, these master students are primarily uh, international, maybe eight out of 10 are, are, are international and maybe two Swedish students. Uh, Okay. But then there are more Swedish students in the in the other program. Right, and usually those Swedish students would presumably have, like you said, started with the three years and then they're continuing. So, okay, that's really cool. That's good to know. Oh, uh, if I may uh, add mm. one thing, is also that we have also the same setup. Uh, uh, the, the whole course is that, uh, except for one course, which is specifically for this group of students, the rest of the courses are shared with uh, students from uh, a mechanic program or physics. So we have 60, 70 students. So uh, yeah, so the, they have this chance of, you know, uh, integrating to the rest of the, the students. It's not that they are isolated in the courses. No, all the courses are shared with other programs and other students, Swedish students participating in those courses. Yes. 
Great, thank you. And do you um, do you find that you have a, um, a diverse mix of international students in the classroom from all different places? Or um, is there like a trend for students to come from any particular country, for example? Um, I'm just curious, <laughs> like maybe we can uh, just open that to the to the to the whole group. But is it a mixture or? For us, is it's a, a very good mix, I, I yeah. would say. We don't have a big minority of you know, a, a big uh, group from one country we have from from everywhere. Yeah. At least the, the two years that has been uh, going, so it was like that. We'll see for the next year. Cool, that's cool. Uh, yeah, I um, I guess with some of your programs being quite small groups, it's not really like you can't really necessarily see like huge trends or anything, but it's nice to know because I think in general, as a university, we like to have that mixture of, uh viewpoints and backgrounds etc so great okay i'll now uh have a look and see what other questions um i can ask you so um we've kind of mentioned a little bit about the this idea of small class size and close uh, uh sort of um open contact uh between the staff and uh the students as well and i would like to um ask a little bit about the opportunities um, for connections or collaboration with industry. Um, so I know uh, some of the programs may offer some kind of research uh, project and some may perhaps have connections with industry. Perhaps we could talk a little bit more about uh, what that looks like for your programs. So uh, we'll go around the same order, Michael, then Hassan, then Liang, then Dan. Thank you. Well, well I would say that uh... We don't really have internships during the first one and a half years of the program because yeah, the coursework is, is uh, the classes are kind of dominating. Uh, but but then later the the last half year is a degree project. It's it's half a year, thirty credits, and uh, the idea is that you can choose whether you go to a company or whether you want to do it with the research at university. So you can, depending on your preferences, either go more the academic side or more going towards industry by doing the degree project companies. And this is actually a very common path here. It's, it's most of our students actually go to some companies. So it is possible to find uh, projects there and we are also supporting this. So I think this is, this is the, best step into the uh, industry world and, and many people like to do that also so that they can possibly get job opportunities directly if they have done a good job. But then I should also say that many students are asking much earlier if they could work at companies and, and this is a little bit harder and uh, it's, it's not so easy because you need the specific background. Uh, so, so it's more encouraged towards the end of the program than in the first years because you should first develop yourself and get the skills that, that are then requested by you. So that means people would have to do more like side jobs that are independent of the program in, in the early stages. Yeah, that makes sense. And also, I suppose uh, it, it's just good to know that those opportunities do come later when you have got that experience. So, yeah, great. And Hassan? Uh, okay, uh, it's, it's very similar to, to what uh, Michael was saying. Uh, we have uh, the, the master's program is basically, the, the sorry, the master thesis is basically the, the, a very good opportunity for the students to do project at uh, relevant industries. And we have many many industries who are interested send us uh, proposals and we distribute them among the students so usually the amount of project the number of projects is more than the number of students so they have always projects uh, waiting for students to be to pick them so that's one thing of course there is a possibility of do the pro master project as a research project because we do a lot of research in the department and that's also possible if they want to continue as a PhD students uh, in the future. But we also have uh, 
usually we have uh, guest lectures in most of the courses that are invited from uh, industry. So they come, they present their, their work, they present their company, and uh, it's a possibility of to, to starting some contact and some discussion between the, uh, you know, company representative and the students. And also we have uh, study visits uh, for some of the courses that we actually take the student to a power plant or to, you know, uh, uh, production sites so and they, they can talk and uh yeah see the the work from close yeah that sounds really interesting yeah then then i will continue uh, as i already mentioned uh, the embedded in the electronics engineering program has very close contact with the industry so we also start with the invited lectures in the courses and then some students will have a summer internship in some of the companies like ericsson axis and then actually recent years, most of our students are doing their master thesis in the companies. Um, if I need to give numbers, I have to say 70% around in recent two or three years. And then, of course, many of them ended up being employed by the company afterwards. Uh, so the job market is quite good. At least the uh, recent years. I cannot predict the future. Of course, but it's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, then our science is, is uh, I don't know, maybe to me, obviously, but uh, it is at least uh, less connected to industry or less directly connected to industry. Uh, there's definitely uh, connections, uh, lots of startup companies and also larger companies that are interested in, in nanoscience aspects, uh, nanotechnology. Um, but in the program, the same as for the other programs, the last uh, semester uh, is, is a thesis project, and that can also be done in industry. Most students don't. Most students uh, in this program uh, choose to do a, a research project within a research department. But as I said, we have this non alone organization, so it's not only physics, it could be chemistry or electric. Many do it in electrical engineering and non electronics. So lots of uh, uh, projects usually in a research group but it can it also happens that it is uh, at a company uh, so that that is a possibility okay, uh, when it you, comes to yeah. where the students go then someone connected to this so i think most of the students from this program they actually go into phd studies afterwards but there are those who go uh, and then maybe to industry but uh, also those that go straight to industry but uh, i think it's um if it's because, because if you choose a program because you're interested in continuing with research or if the program convinces you to con continue with research, I don't know, but many students do continue with research. Okay, great. Um, and do you have any tips uh, for students in terms of um, advice for seeking work in these fields after studies, do you find that your students uh, tend to stay in Sweden? I mean, you, some of you have mentioned that they often end up working with the companies where they um, have uh, had some kind of placement or um, or is it that they go on to other things? Maybe you can give a couple of examples, uh, each of you, as to what the, the general um, future is for your um, for your students and any tips that you have for how they can find a job after this after this master's program uh yes michael well well i would say that it's a big mixture here also that uh, there are many people that stay in lund there are uh, quite a few people that stay in sweden outside lund but it can also happen that some people went to other places in Europe or that they go back to their home countries. Uh, these are the most common, I would say. Uh, and uh, there are opportunities here locally, but of course, it's a market there. It depends also on your performance during the studies, uh, what, you, what you can get as an offer. But I would say in general that from how the program is set up, the skills that you get here should give you opportunities to find jobs everywhere in that in that field. Okay, so basically working hard on the program is the main <laughs> the is main thing they can for, do. For getting a, a good, good job, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Hassan? Uh Okay, I don't have the statistics because we haven't had the graduates from the program yet. 
So what they, uh, you know, are they gonna stay or they're gonna go back to their own countries or yeah. somewhere else in Europe or, you know, the world, I, I don't know. Uh, the talks that uh, we, we actually, I talk with the students a lot. Uh, so uh, it seems that the job market is, is okay, at least right now. And there are uh, good opportunities, especially because they can find, you know, the master's uh, program uh, thesis at the company. So uh, I think it's, it's promising in that sense, but uh, in uh, some months, I maybe can answer this question better. <laughs> yeah, definitely, that's totally fine. But I guess it's uh, it's hope. Hopefully, some of the students will build those connections in the time uh, that they're with them and make a great impression. Like I think that's a general good tip to give is that if you're like thinking about that, then sometimes an opportunity can come. I think, especially here in Sweden, often it's about like the person and how they uh see you as a whole person um, yes. in the company so it's great that they have those opportunities yes. um liang you already actually did mention uh some things about this like certain statistics around uh how many will continue in those uh, programs but if you'd like to add anything else about other routes that happen yeah. after studies yeah, I can shortly add something beyond going to the industry. I think many of our students also ended up in academia as a PhD students. For example, in our research group, I can say that half of our PhD students are actually from the program. And then some PhD students, uh, uh, some master students also went to other European countries like Netherlands for PhD students. So it's actually a mixture between industry and academia. Okay. And Dan, you already mentioned that many of your students go on to research. But again, if you'd like to add yeah, any tips yeah. you have for them. <laughs> Not really. I don't know what tips it will be. <laughs> um, but I, I just wanted to add, Dan, that uh, many, many stay in Lund, at Lund University, mm -hmm. become a PhD student here. But there are also plenty who go elsewhere to either locally here around in Denmark or, or uh, Norway, uh, but also uh, lots in, uh, in Europe. And and elsewhere. So so um, depending on what you want. So there, I think there are great opportunities. And I think it's uh, having a, a master's degree from Lund University is uh, helpful in Sweden, but I think in all of Europe, uh, if you want to apply for a for a PhD position, uh, it, it's sort of a quality mark. So. Yeah, if I may one, add one last thing, that yeah. the most people when they come to Lund, they are falling in love with Lund and they don't want to leave. Yeah, <laughs> that has also been my experience. I also studied here, although in the humanities side, and certainly fell in love with with Lund. So I agree. Um, Hassam, actually, I'm quite curious about your program because you've mentioned a couple of times that it is a new uh, a new program. And how are you finding that in terms of the evolution of the program? Are you finding that it's um, changing as you're continuing over the past couple of years uh, do you see any changes that are likely to happen going forward um are students involved with this you know in terms of like evolving the program yes actually uh has very uh, interesting uh, question actually because we are we are working with this uh, uh every day basically we have a lot of contact with the students to thinking about is this the optimum way? Is this the best way that uh, you know we are uh, presenting our courses, our uh, uh, you know research knowledge? Is it transferred in the best way to the students or not? So we already have made some changes to the program in terms of the courses that are were part of the program. Now we are moving them around and adding new courses, removing some, and we are uh, gaining experience, uh, which uh, I think now we have a very uh, well uh, uh, organized uh, course, uh, course package for the coming uh, year and uh, very recently has been got the approval of the board uh, of the study so I think we're going to go ahead with those changes it's not very fundamental but uh, just just tweaking some details that we are getting feedback from the students that they think that okay if would have been much better if it was in this way so uh, yes, some changes are uh, being made and uh, hopefully it makes the program even more 
attractive to the students. Brilliant, thank you. Um, actually, I'm also curious about the facilities and the kind of resources that um, are available for our students as well. And Dan, you mentioned about, for example, ESS and um, Max4 and things like this, but perhaps you would like to speak a little about the kind of um, facilities that the students have available to them. Uh, so, so we, we are doing lots of research here. Uh, we have uh, our uh, or locally um, next door. I just see it across the, on some window. Uh, we have this uh, fancy clean room uh, for for processing of, of nanostructures and so on. So this uh, it's not open to anyone at any always right but but if you do a project where which requires this and then then you can get access to this and the same with all uh, other research uh, facilities we have uh, i don't know if this was what you were thinking of then of course we have a library and we have a, a, a space for students to to study or to uh, so but but for the we have um, uh, some really uh, state-of-the-art research facilities. We have lots of laboratories for research and uh, several of the courses are doing lab exercises in these uh, facilities. And uh, then there is also projects possible, both a thesis project, but also other projects that could spend more time in, 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 in using some of these facilities. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of, because of course, people will be coming from all over the world and maybe curious to know what kind of expectations they can have in terms of the facilities that are available to them. Um, would any of our other panelists like to add anything special about their program uh, facilities or it's covered already? <laughs> yeah. we, we have a, a, a lab called Energy Lab where mm -hmm. we test different renewable fuels and we have a, on combustion engines and we have very close collaboration with, the, with big uh, uh, Swedish and even international uh, car manufacturer like Scania, Volvo. We also have a wind tunnel which uh, can be used, for example, for master thesis uh, research if the students are interested. And we also have a lot of uh, lasers that they it can be used for uh, measuring, for example, flow field around the uh, wind turbine blade or you know uh, studies like that. Okay. And if I may, I can yeah. add um, one, two things. One specific to the program that uh, for our program, we actually have access to the um, uh, semiconductor, semiconductor technology that the students actually have the opportunity to fabricate their own integrated circuits. And then I think another thing I have like to say broadly here in the new university is that the, actually those programs and as we are presenting today are not separated, we are connected. And then we actually collaborate with each other like wireless and then our program are in the same department and for nanoscience, they're not in natural engineering. And the energy, of course, it's uh, very important for all the areas. So actually that's a very unique thing in the university. Great to, hear, great to hear, thank you. Um, and we're kind of actually, we're speaking a little bit about research as well now when we're talking about these different areas that the students can work with. Um, so I was actually uh, wondering if you each would like to highlight perhaps one specific uh, area of research that's a strength of the department or where you stand out because I think the attendees will probably have their niche interests <laughs> uh, in terms of research and might be quite curious about what kinds of uh, yeah strengths each each uh, course focuses on. Um, maybe we can go around uh, from Michael again and Hassan and then Liang and Dan. Okay, yes, uh, for the wireless program, I would say the research here at the department uh, is very strong in the field of multiple antenna systems. Uh, this is called MIMO, multiple input, multiple output. To get more data over the air, you're using lots of antennas. And this is a hot topic in 5G and beyond, 6G and so on. The new generations of wireless will use that a lot. 
And uh, we have some very top research in this area. Some pioneering work has been done here in this area of big antenna systems in collaboration with a group of the well, youngest, with the hardware people. We have done efforts together in that field. And then other even more recent topics that are very hot are going to higher frequencies uh, using terahertz communications or uh, even millimeter wave communications. These are trends that are currently very hot and, and we are at the front of this research here. Brilliant. And Hassan? Um, okay, so I can only speak about uh, uh, the energy sciences, one of the departments which has the biggest share in this uh, program, but there are other researchers in other uh, active uh, partners in this program, which I'm not, uh, going to talk about now but here we have ba basically three main uh, uh, groups of research one on fluid mechanics which uh, for, for instance the design and optimization of uh, uh, wind turbines is, is one example of those research the other one is in heat transfer which can be in uh, like from fuel cell, which involve very small scale, to all to heat exchangers or you know even the larger scales like in uh, engines and uh, furnaces, and we also have uh, some research on combustion, which uh, or fuel conversion, for instance, in bioenergy production. Uh, but uh, I think uh, solar and uh, PVs and fuel cell also a competence of the other departments involved in this uh, in this program. Thank you. Yeah, and um, yeah, what I can say is that the integrated circuits and the electronic systems are the key enabler for many applications like uh, machine learning, 5G and 6G. And then what's the unique thing is that we work together with other areas, as Mika already mentioned. Actually, here in Lund, we built the very first 5G prototype systems, and now we are building the 6G system. And then what is unique is that the, the master students can get involved in this research project. I can talk about myself that actually I have two and three master students implementing the 6G prototype system together with the PhD students. Great. And then finally, Dan? Yeah. Neuroscience, as I said, is extremely broad, but let's take it from, from my perspective. Uh, what we are, um, a lot of what is done is based on that we have a, a very good standing in material science, in making semiconductor, primary semiconductor materials uh, with control on the nanoscale. And we can combine different materials and get uh, different properties. And so it's a fundamental interest there, but also opens for many uh, um, applications. Some of them in collaboration with, say, electrical engineering and making transistors uh, based on, on, on nanoscale semiconductors. Uh, also actually connected to sustainable energy. So we have some, some uh, uh, very successful research in, in uh, photovoltaics, solar cells, um, and also in, in making LEDs in a more efficient way and, and so on. Uh, but also in sort of um, fundamental electric, Electrical transport, how is electrical properties, uh, which uh, also uh, uh, is of relevance for quantum technology and the quantum communication, uh, quantum communication, quantum computing. Uh, uh, so there is some some fundamental research which is uh, sort of on the edge of actually becoming technology that we, we will see in, in real in daily life. Uh, we also have quite some uh, biophysics uh, applications, both. A lot of it actually around these uh, semiconductor nanostructures to use these uh, structures in order to detect uh, uh, diseases or to analyze uh, uh, blood samples, and for instance, or or to DNA um, analysis and uh, you know, things like this. So, yeah, this was what I see from my perspective, and then then it's even more uh, out there in, in terms of um, research. Yeah, brilliant. It's great to highlight just some of those areas and it all sounds extremely fascinating. Um, so the uh, webinar is 
coming to an end already. Um, and I would just really like to uh, firstly just highlight uh, to those who are watching that my colleague has posted some links in the chat um, for if you want to read more about our engineering and technology programs, um, whether you want to also, if you want to chat with some students who study some of the programs, um, also to contact us if you have any general questions about the application process, for example, or if you want to attend any of our other events that are happening over the next couple of weeks. So please do check out those links. And then I would like to also just thank everybody um, for attending. And then I would like to end with um, just maybe one thing that you would really like students to know about your program, something you haven't been able to share, something you want to add. Um, so we will do a final round. Uh, and just if you have something else that you just want to, to tell the students today that you haven't had a chance to mention, um, something they should know, uh, then we can share it now. So uh, Michael, would you like to? Well, well, I would say that uh, there used to be a big wave of wireless communications that has somehow given the impression that it saturates. Maybe people think problems are solved because you can have internet on your cell phone and that's it. But but there is so much more to do, I can say. And, and the industry currently, I can't speak for the future, but the industry currently is really looking for well-educated people in this area because there is kind of now more like a shortage of students. We would like to have more. Uh, I think we're doing a lot of research, but the student number is relatively small. There are lots of opportunities to engage and, and show what you can do here. Uh, because there are always new challenges, you know, that the number of devices that are connected is increasing constantly, and there are a lot of open problems to deal with. Uh, it, it's far from being solved, so just keep in mind. Definitely. And Hassan? Uh, I don't want to uh, paint a green picture here, but uh, it, the world, worldwide uh, major uh, sources of energies are still fossil fuel, and we have to we have to do something about that. And this in this program, we are really looking to to educate people to, to who are able to come up with with solutions that that can help the future of the planet in terms of producing more carbon neutral energies in you know a different uh, solutions for the this big problem that we are facing and i think this is a very great opportunity for 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 people to to have a meaningful impact on the future Definitely. And we've actually, as an institution, we've recently been ranked like 12th in the world for sustainability. And so it's like an important topic, so important right now, I think, as you've said. So, and uh, Leanne? Yeah, I think I said what I wanted to say. And then one, one last thing is that uh, you can find the most of the information on our program webpage. You just ask Google, search our program name, Nunda University, and then you find it. And then there is also contact email. If you have any questions, just write me an email and I'm happy to answer and then send you applications. Thank you. And then finally, Dan. One thing that maybe I could mention is that uh, um, this program has nanoscience. The first semester is, is with mandatory courses, but the rest uh, is two, two semesters of uh, elective courses this and then the, the thesis project. So this opens for lots of opportunities for the students to choose their own way. And depending on your background, as I said, we have bachelors. I don't require a specific bachelor degree, but it could be in various backgrounds. Uh, and then depending on your background, you could move in, in, in different uh, ways. So, so you can shape your own uh, program. Uh, I also wanted to, uh, I was didn't know this about ranking um, in, in sustainability, but this sustainability is, as I already mentioned with photovoltaics, is, uh, but also other things like uh, power uh, electricity, which is needed for going to a more electric, uh, an electric society, uh, and also materials for sustainability. This is a very much a focus of the research, uh, also in nanoscience. 
Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody, uh, all of our program coordinators who joined us today. Thank you. Um, and if you are if you're watching and you're interested in one of our other programs, um, we will also have a second webinar later um, with program coordinators in pharmaceutical technology, energy efficient and environmental building design, water resources engineering and virtual reality and augmented reality. So I'm sure that we'll get a lot of interesting uh, feedback there as well. Um, we have recorded this uh, presentation so it will be available for others who have missed it and I really hope that those who have watched today have found it useful and interesting as I have. Um, we will definitely be uh, doing this again in the future so please keep in touch with us um, as my colleague said you can get in touch with us about program specific questions or you can get in touch with members of my team the recruitment team for more general questions and we would love to uh, help you and hopefully we will see some of you next year in Lund. Thank you again, everybody, for attending and best wishes. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.